All right. This is part two. The truth about Jerusalem is bigger than you think. Last week, we covered a lot of ground. We uh, started with the split of the kingdom under Solomon. One of the main things that I did, the points that I brought across was the tie of the occult that's been in human history, even going back to the garden, right? Uh, Satan and his darkness and his plans of deception. You know, I heard one preacher say one time he started off in the garden as a serpent and in the end, in the book of Revelation, he's called a dragon. And so the serpent brings in deception, but the dragon brings in destruction through violence. And upon the earth, you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I have it in my notes, but the Lord himself talked about the fact that Satan has power on the earth and we need to understand that because he is good at what he does in his deception. And, uh, there's a lot of deception interconnected to the nation of Israel right now, to the city of Jerusalem right now. And so that's what part of this is is really all about again making the connection we, we brought connection of the occult world into the roman empire we made a, a big deal about that and tonight we're really gonna start to get into more information regarding that i did want to make the point that the name palestine was archaeologically as far as i can tell first mentioned by the Emperor Hadrian of the Roman Empire in 135 BC. He quashed the rebellion of the Jews and they tried to uh, come back against him. And so anyway, again, he quashed that rebellion and then he purposefully named the area. He said the name of the area was Palestine and he was naming it after the Philistines, which he would have known from the scripture was their ancient enemies. Again, in 5 BC, the historian Herodotus also mentioned the word in the Bible, you see other words being utilized for various uh, areas of geography like Caesarea Philippi, which Caesarea would come from the name terms of the Caesars. So the Bible was written in the New Testament under the time frame of the Roman Empire. What is my point? The point is, is that it's not the Bible is honest that the names had been utilized or changed under Roman rule and Roman words were used, but the Romans didn't call it Palestine. And that it really began to re be referred to Palestine more in the British Empire, actually, whenever the nation of Israel was coming back into existence is whenever the world, if you will, I would say under the leadership of the United Nations began to refer to it as Palestine, wherever, whereas the rest of uh, most of us call it Israel, okay? Um, so where we ended last, week was we talked about the fact that Muhammad died about 632 AD. We mentioned a lot about Muhammad and how he developed that army and how he was called a lot of information about Alberto Rivera. Um, very, I feel like very interesting information about how the Catholic Church wanted a army to help them gain control of the city of Jerusalem. Um, and so Muhammad died and it was a few years later that his army was able to actually take the city and then because of the rebellion in AD 70 where the Jews tried to combat the Roman Empire in AD 70 the temple had been destroyed under General Titus of the Roman Empire and so the Temple Mount was flattened out and after the Muslims took control of the city of Jerusalem, they were able to begin the erection of the uh, Dome of the Rock, which was built over the next, um, you know, 50 to 100 years. T General Titus's destruction of the temple actually fulfilled the prophecy that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24 two, and Jesus said unto them, see ye not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And so the person that ended up surrendering to the Muslim army was a man named Sophronius, who was, last week we mentioned that, Con that Constantine, who saw that vision in the sky of the cross and it said, conquer under this sign, split the Roman Empire into two legs. One was the West, which was the Roman 
portion and then he named the capital which was in Turkey Constantinople after him who his name was Constantine Sophronius was a leader of the eastern leg of the Roman Empire and he had control of Jerusalem at the time that the rush that the Muslim army came in and he surrendered Jerusalem to this Muslim army at that uh, point in time so where we're moving into next has to do with this guy here Pope Urban II this is about 400 years later and he is credited with starting the Catholic Crusades. I'm calling them the Catholic Crusades instead of the Christian Crusades to make a specific point. It wasn't anything Christian about it. You know, Jesus said, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Jesus told Pontius Pilate, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, my disciples would fight. But, there, but we're not, this is not my kingdom. And so Jesus never instructed anybody per se to do the atrocities that were done during the Christian, during the Catholic Crusades. And, and, I, and, and in reality, I've already really gone out on a limb and said it. I'm going to say it now. Catholicism is not mainstream Christianity. Uh, you know, sometimes we just we hinder ourselves and we pretend that everything is normal with it, but it's not. I made the point last week. It's basically forms of Babylonian mystery religions that's intertwined with Christian documentation. And it doesn't mean that the people that go to Catholic churches are not genuine people that love God, because I know many people that are very genuine that love God. And again, I'll say this. It's not to say that the Jew, that the Jewish people that live in Jerusalem don't love God. We're talking about the systems that have people trapped. And really what we're talking about here is the whore of Babylon, the one that's riding the seven headed beast. And whenever we're talking about these institutions like Catholicism and political Zionism, all right, and, and, and we're going to be clear about that. We're going to try to make that point when I say political Zionism, that the current state of Israel and how it came into existence, that's really going to be the punchline tonight. That political Zionism is not the same thing as Jude biblical Judaism. And even we made the point last week that the Hasidic Jews that, that, that spend much of their time at the Wailing Wall are actually practicing a form of Kabbalah. And that all of these things go back, it's all connected to the mystery religions. Okay, um, And Kabbalah is some really wicked stuff the deeper you get into it. So again, I don't know how deeply these guys get into it. But going back to Pope Urban II, he, he is credited with uh, starting the Christian Crusades. He preached a message that sparked the first uh, crusade. And it's important to remember that, that the Catholic Church, we, we just said that, is not biblical. And that the popes were, during this time frame, trying to gain power. They were, there, there was a rush to gain power. And, and, and so we see that it was a very political standpoint and these, and these wars are taking place. But for some reason, they wanted Jerusalem so badly. And I have my opinion on what it is and, and we'll get into it at, at some point in time. But, but they wanted to, there was a frenzy to gain control of Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, let me make the point now. Satan knows some things based upon the word of God, right? So again, here we are, we're, we're AD 300 for Constantine. Now we're up to 1000 AD-ish right here. And the word of God, and I made a little bit of this comment last week, but let me say it again. Scholars believe that the book of Revelation would have been written at about AD 95. And how it takes time, you gotta understand, they didn't have a printing press. They didn't have copy machines. Scribes, that's what a scribe is in the Bible. They had to write it by hand. They had quill, uh, quill, ink, papyrus, and scribes, they were copyists. And they copied and copied. And then if they messed up, so they, they would look for one little mess up, they were supposed to destroy it and throw it away. And then, and then there, there they went. And so it takes time for these documents to be circulated, right? And so we're talking like uh, Hebrews and Galatians written about AD 65, the book of Revelation written about AD 95. How long does it take for these things to be circulated? But by now I can assure you these documents are circulated. And so the, what is your point? Well, I'm about to get into it right here because let's take a look at a couple of the scriptures that they would have had access to and to try. I'm just trying to share with you how I think 
just because I think this way doesn't make me right. I'm trying to share with the audience, whoever the audience is, what I have uncovered and what I believe based upon my study of the scripture is going on, has been going on, and what the plan moving forward is and why this matters when we see turmoil that takes place in Jerusalem. Whether this is it or not, only time will tell. But when it takes place, I expect it to be almost exactly something like what we're seeing, okay? And before tonight's over, you should be able to understand why I believe that, all right? So here's Jesus, Matthew 24, 15. He says, <laughs> when you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso reads, let him understand. Now we talked about this last week. Y'all remember that. There was a partial fulfillment of this prophecy in the book of Daniel, Daniel prophesied that the little horn that blasted into the ram that had two different horns was Alexander the Great. We find that out. He was the, he was the prince, the king of Grecia. And Alexander the Great destroyed the Persian Empire. But then after he died, like Daniel prophesied, his kingdom was split into four horns. And that's exactly what happened to Alexander's kingdom. It was split into four. And through the Seleucids, which was one of the horns of the four, through the Seleucid dynasty, after about a couple hundred years after Alexander died, a man named Antiochus Epiphanes IV did exactly what it looks like the Antichrist is going to do again. He took an image of Zeus, put it inside the temple. He made them quit reading Torah. He told them they could no longer circumcise their sons. And he laid a pig on the altar. And that's what started the Maccabean revolt. And he said, worship me, the human form of Zeus. It's exactly, almost verbatim, what we expect the Antichrist also to do, to put an image, he's going to make an image to the beast, Revelation 13, he's going to demand the whole world worship it, and he's going to sit within the temple, and he's going to demand, he's going to call himself God, and he's going to demand that people worship him, right? And so here's Jesus saying, though, we, now, now we know, even though we know that the abomination that causes desolation was partially fulfilled by Daniel's prophecy, we know that it wasn't the final fulfillment because Jesus comes about 500 years later and says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, okay, let him understand. It, well, look, let's look what it says right here, specifically. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. He's talking about the temple. So in order for that to happen, there has to be a temple. I made the point last week. I'll make the point again. Every now and then in the back of my mind, I think of our vessel as a temple because the apostle Paul said that we, he does allude to us as being a temple. And people have made the comment before, well, what if Satan just, what if he just wants to get our, our heart, like to give us allegiance, the antichrist? Well, he does. And ultimately he wants to get us as individuals. I personally believe that there is going to be a temple, but I made the point last week also that if there's not a temple and some dude rises to power and wants people to put some kind of a mark or a chip in their right hand or their forehead and pledge allegiance to his new order, you're not going to do that anyway, because you would know. So just to throw that out there, right? But I believe that there's going to be a temple rebuilt. Now this is second Thessalonians chapter two, verse three, let no man deceive you by any means that day shall not come except there comes a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You understand? So by the time C Constantine supposedly gets his vision in the sky, by the time the Roman empire split in two, by the time that the popes are trying to rise, these scriptures have been copied and they're reading them. And they can see this. What is your point? My point is the devil knows now. The devil knows prophetically, New Testament wise, that in order for him to try to bring about his kingdom, he's going to have to take control of Jerusalem. Okay. And he, his man of sin is going to have to sit in the temple. Does he not know that? I mean, so my point is, is that this is, you think that the devil, I'm just trying to listen. I don't. I'm just trying to say, I'm trying, I try to think like the adversary so that I can understand. 
You think he's never tried to break God's word down? <laughs> you, you think he's never tried to make God's word a lie? You, you think he hasn't thrown all of his arsenal at trying to make God's word not come to pass? I promise you, he has. Now, after you've been pummeled quite a bit and failed multiple times, maybe at some point in time, you try to change your strategy. Maybe at some point in time, you try to just go along with it and then maybe in the very end you try again to you, you understand what I'm saying so now that you know what's written it's like it makes sense to me that you're going to try to weave your scheme within the realm of what's already written by the God that you defied and you know that you were created by and listen let me just say this too uh, you know I, I believe that the devil thinks he's going to win and i believe that the people that have thrown their lot in with Satan believe that they're going to win because see sin you and I anybody listening y'all know sin deceives and when you open up the door to sin you think you're just going to get a little nibble but the reality of it is is that it don't ever end in a nibble before you know it unless the Lord show up and deliver you you'll be right back where you were before and you'll think you're okay You'll be sitting there on the couch looking at stuff you ain't got no business looking at and doing things you ain't got no business doing. And in your mind, you'll be thinking you're okay. You ain't, you're not okay because you're living your life contrary to the word of God, right? Just think about him. <laughs> Just think about how deceived he is. Just think about how deceived his own people are. I'm going to introduce you to a character. Many of you already may know him. Alistair Crowley tonight. They say on his deathbed, he said his last words were, I am so perplexed. I bet you are. I bet you're very perplexed, sir. You thought that you you, you thought that you were about about to head in and get your kingship in hell, and what you were realizing is that demons were already tormenting you before you crossed over to the other side. You're not the devil's buddy. No, he's going to destroy you because he's being destroyed, and he's going to torment you because he's going to be tormented. Anyway, that's another story. The point that I'm trying to make is is that now these scriptures are written and evil knows about them. And that's my opinion on why there's such a fight for Jerusalem or has been a fight for Jerusalem. But God is sovereign. God is all powerful. God is omnipotent, not the enemy. And, and none of this happens until God says it happens. And I would like to make this point again. I made it last week, but I'll make it again. Daniel said, essentially the idea is, is that what is written will come to pass. I've, I've heard people say, you know, it's the church's fault that these things are happening. Well, the church could be blamed for a lot. I'll agree with that. Matt Abair could be blamed for a lot. I'll agree with that. We all need to wake up. <laughs> we need to wake up and let the Lord use us. But let me say this. The Lord said this is going to happen. It's written in the book. There's no stopping it. We might be able to delay it as we pray. We might be able to kick the can down the road. Okay, but when God, but when God sets the timing it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. Okay. And so anyway, <coughs> here he is. And he sits in the temple of God and he shows himself that he is God. Now we're moving on to Revelation 13. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. So this is talking about the false prophet. The first one, the first beast was the Antichrist. So the, so the beast coming up out of the earth had two horns like a lamb. Isn't that something? So he looks like a lamb. <coughs> And he speaks like a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly head or deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he de and deceives them that dwell on the earth. By means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. I mean, think about this. I don't want to get into this too much right now, but think about the fact that how many times have you witnessed the people and tried to talk to them about the kingdom of God? I know I've talked to quite a few people and have had some really good results with some, but some really bad results with others. Just like, dude, you believe that? Really? And 
you think about the people that r repeatedly have rejected and their hearts are hard and, and then they're alive during this. Whenever fire comes down from heaven, when there's signs and wonders and miracles, when there's a counterfeit resurrection, I mean, that's serious deception, you know? Um, so it's just a thought, right? And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Isn't that interesting that the image of the beast speaks? And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the same or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So the point <coughs> to all of these scriptures was, was this was that we're in a time frame, we're 1045 AD right now, but I'm making the, the point that these people who are under the influence of the occult world, who are under the influence of demonic spirits are aware of this. Whether they realize that they're taking Jerusalem for this purpose or not, I don't know. But just as in your own life, if, how many people have been serving the Lord more than 15 years in here? Okay. Were there times back at, when you were for early on in the faith that the Lord showed you something in your spirit and you didn't know exactly what it meant, but then maybe five years later it made more sense. Ten years later it makes more sense. Even, even in the Old Testament, whenever, and I, I'm completely shooting from the hip here, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to give you a good illustration. Okay, for instance, when Zechariah prophesied that here comes your king, Jerusalem. He's lowly and riding on a donkey. He prophesied that. And, and the Israelite people for 500, 450, 500 years read that passage of scripture, but it didn't really necessarily make a whole lot of sense. I don't know that Zechariah really understood it that well, right? When he prophesied it. But then one day Jesus comes riding into town a week before the cross on a donkey. And then it's like, at some point in time, whether it was happening right then and there or over the next 15 years or so, bing, bing, bing. It's like, what? I, I'm reading Zechariah now. That was what Jesus did. He wrote. So the point that I'm trying to make is, is that revelation is progressive. Yeah. And if revelation is progressive for the people of God, you think that the plans of the enemy as he worked. I want you to start thinking like this. I mean, I, I hate to ask you to think like this, but if we're nearing the end, like I think we are, and depending on your timing of the rapture, okay, uh, it, it, it might be important that we start being really prepared in our mind and in our heart for what could be lying ahead. And what I'm trying to say is, is this, is that if the people of God have received progressive revelation and as we as individuals trust God and God slowly unveils for us the things that he's spoken to us in the past, okay, and also in the kingdom of God, then these people that have sold their soul to the enemy, and that's what these people have done. I'm talking about, we're talking about people that have purposely sold their soul to Satan to be used as vessels to bring forth a satanic agenda of a new world order upon the face of the earth so that the evil one, the Antichrist, gets his last 3.5 years just like Jesus had his three and a half years while he was on earth. Okay, that's what his whole plan is. And he wants to deceive and bring as many people with him as he can. And I'm telling you right now, these layers of deception are piled upon each other. And it becomes unbelievable how, you know, God is like, God is truth. Amen. And he says, bring it to the light. Let's expose it. And, and you, you feel the freedom, right? When you bring it to the light. Evil, wicked men don't come to the light because they don't want their evil deeds exposed. And they stay in darkness. And they one of the things that I've learned as I've studied this, they stack layer upon layer upon layer and all kind of disinformation to throw you off the trail. And, and, and because they're trying to hide their plans. Okay. And, and, and it's, it is quite, it is quite the mess. But the point that I'm trying to make is hallelujah. God is greater. That's one thing. But at the same time, uh, I want you to know 
that I don't know that they know exactly what they're doing. It's almost like it's a need to know basis. And actually I've read multiple articles that talked about that. They only know what they, what they, they only allow them to know what they need to know. Okay. Um, that's why people in the masonry, you don't really know what you're doing supposedly until you hit the 33rd degree. And some people have said even some of the 33rd degrees don't know, but at some point in time, they understand that they're pledging allegiance to Lucifer. Okay. All the, whenever they first join, they give them a King James Bible and a Mason book and they, and they like, but, and they got to go through all of these rituals. And then finally, one day when they finally reach the end of whenever it's revealed to them, multiple tests to make sure they're not going to defect and all this other kind of stuff. Then they're told they actually, the G on their little apron stands not for the God Adonai, but Lucifer. Okay. And then by that time, dude, you so need deep in it. What you going to do? Okay. And uh, so anyway, so that's, that's where I wanted to go. So here's Revelation 13, 18. Here's wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, his number is 600, three score and six. I mean, there's a lot that could be said about that, but we're not preaching on that. First of all, man was created on the sixth day. Okay. S secondly, God uses human vessels to accomplish his will on earth. That's why I was trying to say when we come together in unity and pray in the sanctuary or we pray, God will use that. It, it's man's business to pray. It's God's business to answer prayer and to move. He's waiting on human beings that he can fill with his spirit and that will partner with him in his plan on the earth. And just as God is doing that, the enemy is also looking for human vessels that he can fill with demonic spirits. Now, we're not talking about, listen, I know I probably said this last week. Maybe I didn't. We're not talking about collateral damage. We're not talking about people that get hooked on drugs and alcohol and looking at horror movies and engaging in all kind of bad whatever they're doing and, and open up doors and invite demons in. And that really and truly, they're just engaging in some kind of a party lifestyle to hide pain. That's one thing. That's, that's what I call collateral damage. That's that exorcist movie. Okay, that's not what we're talking about right here. We're talking about people. I'll introduce you to a couple people tonight. We're talking about people that purposefully invite demonic spirits to use their vessel to be part of the plan to bring about this new world order. All right. So here you go. Let him who has wisdom understand. So man was created on the sixth day. It's the fulfillment. Six, six, six. Just as God uses man, the enemy is looking for man to help him. And that's what he told him in the garden. This is, this is kind of, I might have mentioned this last week, but this is what he told him in the garden. The day that you eat thereof, you will not die. Instead, you will know knowledge, illumination, and you will become as God's. Just as he said, I'm going to raise myself above the throne of God. He's turning around and getting trying to get man to also buy into this lie and for him to be able to become a God. And interestingly, I might've mentioned it because it's one of my big things is the Apple computer and how the first Apple computer sold for $666 and 66 cents. Okay. It, it, and it's it, it, the point to all of that is this, is that it's knowledge, it's illumination, and it's all part of a scheme. You know, the guy, Alistair Crowley, I'm going to introduce you to in a little bit. He's the one that taught him that you're going to communicate to each other through symbolism. So the occult world, when they saw the bit in Apple, I didn't catch on to it for five, six years till I understood how they started to think. But the whole occult world understood, oh, they're on our team. And these, and listen, we're talking about billionaires. We're talking about multimillionaires. We're not talking about my little buddy down the road that I used to go hang out with that was burning incense in his bedroom, wanting to be a warlock. We're talking about serious high level stuff here. Okay. And uh, so anyway, that's that. So here's Zechariah chapter 12, verse nine. It says, it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I want to make a point here. And you may already know this. But when we see things happening like that, I don't know what mainstream Christianity is saying out there, but if, you, if you're ready for the Lord 
to come down now. I'm not saying that God won't intervene. That's not what I'm saying. Let me make that clear. I'm not saying God won't intervene. I believe that we should pray. God could very well. He looked in supposedly in 1948. There's a story out there that on the or after maybe it was actually in the 1960s. I'm kind of off on that date, but the four day war, they called it on the during the four day war. Whenever one of those nations came against Israel, supposedly uh, there's testimonies where some of these other these arm these soldiers from these other armies were chased by hornets <laughs> and abandoned their tanks and everything else. So yeah, God, I'm not trying to question whether God, as we pray, won't intervene. That's not what I'm trying to say. But the big day that we're looking for, where God says, "Oh, you're going to come against my people," and then He really puts it on them, that's after the seven year tribulation. That's at the end of the seven years. That's not at the beginning. And it's important for us to understand that, that in order for the world to receive, and I probably said this last week too, a, a man of sin, who they're going to think is a, is a man of peace, there has to be chaos. There has to be confusion because nobody wants to give up their borders. Nobody wants to give up their sovereignty as a nation. So there's going to have to be chaos and peace. And then all of a sudden you expect for the beast to rise up out of, the, out of the sea and for him to say that he has the answers that people are waiting for. But what Zechariah is talking about is what's going to happen at the end of the seven years. Okay, He says it's going to come to pass that I will destroy the nations that come against Jerusalem. So that's not right now. I don't expect that to be right now. Timing wise. Right. And he says, and I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. See, as a nation, that's going to happen. It's happening. It's happening to individuals. There's individual Jewish people that are accepting Jesus as Messiah. But as a nation or as a people group, they're going to realize, okay, I'm not getting into this in this topic, but in the Daniel chapter nine, there's a, an agreement that is signed between Israel and the man of sin. And the Bible says in Daniel nine, that it's broken in the middle of that last seven year period, which is known as a biblical week. And in the middle of that 3.5 years, it's broken. And in the middle of that, they are going to realize that they had gotten into a covenant agreement with a, with a, with a deceiver that they thought was there to help them, but then he turns around and when the temple's built, he puts himself in the temple and he says, no, you're going to worship me. Okay. That's what's going to happen whenever that takes place. But at the end of it, they're going to realize, and then can you imagine a people group that thought that they were doing something that was good or that the inhabitants, and that really says the inhabitants, by the way, this is just hit me. It doesn't say the leaders. <laughs> The inhabitants, we'll get into that in a second. I'm just saying, it says the inhabitants, the people, will realize. And so what's going to happen is, is that they're going to look upon me whom they pierced. Who's that? Who got pierced? Jesus. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is bitterness for his firstborn. If that's not talking about Jesus, I don't know who it's talking about. And it says, in that day, there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadadrummon in the valley of Megadon, which is connected to the, 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 the valley of Armageddon or the battle of Armageddon. So I'm just trying to, I just wanted to make a point. I don't know what mainstream Christianity is saying, but the destruction of those nations that surround Jerusalem, again, takes place at the end. And that through that, God will save many of his people whenever they realize because they're going to see him differently and they're going to have an awakening that, oh my gosh, we crucified our Messiah. All right. So we're going back to Pope Urban who started the Catholic um, crusades and trying to gain control of Jerusalem away from the Muslims. And so this started these Catholic crusades like we, like we talked about. But during this time frame, this is an interesting uh, addition here came the Knights Templar. You've heard of the Knights Templar. I'm sure people have heard of that. And uh, so the Knights Templar were a kind of like, I guess you could say 
they're similar to the Jesuits today, I believe in my deep studies connected to the Jesuits, which started with Ignatius Loyola, which is kind of like a milit in about 1450, Ignatius Loyola, which became a military arm of the Catholic Church. The Knights Templar were like forerunners to the Jesuits. And, the, and, and from them, there's connections of the Knights Templar to Masonry, the Knights of Columbus, all of these different little societies are interconnected and woven in in some way. Well, well, what's interesting about 1119 AD, the Knights Templar uh, took control and they set up, they became bankers, they acquired lands, they became lenders of money, uh, and they used this mosque as their palace and their headquarters of operation. Now, there's writings out there, you can't prove this stuff, but I, I believe that it's probably true, where they say that the reason they were called the Templars is because of the temple, not the mosque, but the temple. So they, they say that they excavated down and they were getting down in there into Solomon's temple and that they claim that they found all of these mystical type secrets, okay, that, that, but nevertheless, the point that I want you to know is that they ended up becoming black magic practitioners. Now, where they got their information is another story. I'm just telling you things that I've read. And it's a mixture of like Islamic mysticism along with Kabbalah, okay? And it gets to be some uh, really kind of like weird stuff, right? But this is, I wanted to intro you to this guy, Aleister Crowley. I got a couple of pictures of him and this is all gonna kind of come together at some point in time. This is when he was young, smoking his, Pipe. This is him, and as weird as it looks, but the script, not the scripture, the picture says of this book, Aleister Crowley, Magic, Rock and Roll, and the Wickedest Man in the World. Um, this was his mantra. He said, do what thou wilt, and that let that be the whole of the law. In other words, YOLO, you only live once. Do what you want to do. That's the law. Don't listen to anybody tell you, you know, no restriction, just, just live it all out, just lay it all down on the line. So what I wanted you to see here though, I'm introducing this thought to you called Baphomet. Anybody ever heard of Baphomet before? So Baphomet is commonly used in these rock and roll, uh, in the rock and roll industry. Many, I didn't really put any pictures of it because that's not the topic and I'm trying to stay focused. But in the rock and roll industry, you can find multiple, multiple covers of Baphomet. It's a goat, it's a goat head. They supposedly erected one in a city in the United States of America within the last 10 years. They have pictures on the internet of children there by it. And you know, they were like paying homage to it and just different things like that. So this is Aleister Crowley in his Mason uniform. And I wanted you to see in this letter that he wrote how he signed it. I don't know if you can see it or not on the screen, but it says right there in cursive, it says, uh, I'll just get down here so you can kind of see it, Baphomet. He signed it. That was his signature. He called himself Baphomet. And so uh, he, he started this, uh, he started this, Let me get back to where we were. So he started this. Uh, he didn't start it. Someone else started it, but he ended up taking it over. It was called the OTO, or Dallas Templi Orientis. And Templi stands for connection to the Templars. And it was a form of black magic. And, 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 and it's kind of a big deal to get into this. I, I just want you to be aware of these things because we're talking about the black magics part of it to where we get to the end here, okay? And so this is a picture of Baphomet, which is a goat head, you can see. And this is an actual drawing in 1856. This is his, this person's rendition of Baphomet. This is the first time it's ever actually drawn out is in like the 1800s, okay? But the history of Baphomet goes back to the Knights Templar. And that's where I'm, that's what the point that I'm trying to make about all this. This guy's name was Eliphaz Levi that drew this. And, you know, you can see it's just, it's really like the thing is like transgender, you know, um, they didn't call it that. They called it something else. I don't want to really break this down, but you can kind of see it's a goat, right? Uh, and so this is just a blog. I, I ended up scratching some of the stuff out. It wasn't that it was that bad, but I just felt weird when I was reading it because it was like part of their ritual stuff. And by the way, if you start to dig into some of this stuff, just be careful because 
I did this work. After I'm done tonight, I'll probably put it away and I'll listen to people tell me what's going on and I'll judge what I believe and keep praying. But we really need to be praying. I mean, we need to be aware of what the enemy's doing, but we really just need to really be close to the scriptures, close to the Lord. Amen. But I, I just didn't even want to read it because it's just weird. Okay. Uh, so anyway, this is what he, this is what this blog said. There isn't space in this modest blog post to detail the whole belief system of Crowley and its ranging across all kinds of mythologies, religions, and cultish practice, practices. This is a mere taster. The Templar elements centered on initiation rites believed to reflect what the knights practiced and some things that they would do. Okay. Part of it was to defile the crucifix. All right. Add to that the reported worshiping of a being referred to in the trials of the Templars as Baphomet. This was a devilish head of varying description. Most people believe that it was a, a goat head. Uh, see my earlier blog post for accounts from the early 14th century trials stating that this head sometimes spoke gave orders or demanded obedience. I thought that was strange <clears throat> just because of the image of the beast and how it was given power and that it spoke. That's the first time I ever saw that. <clears throat> Crowley lapped all that up. What Crowley believed was that the Templars had indulged in a form of sex-based magic while pretending to be defenders of the Catholic Church. So that's what was going on. They were, def they were pretending to be defenders of the Catholic Church, but they were practicing all this wicked magic his oto was carrying on that noble uh tradition and so uh we're about to get into a little bit more here in a second but in 1187 the muslim leader saladin he retakes jerusalem so again you got all this fighting going back and forth muslims take it catholics take it and it kind of keeps going back again like that well in uh, philip the fourth who was a french king in the 1400s he burns the Knights Templars at the stake for worshiping Baphomet, a goat head that they said spoke to them. And so going backwards into this, where we were in the Byzantine Empire, uh, a lot of things had taken place, right? Uh, and, and, and it ends around 1453. And then the next empire, we're not really going to talk much about it because it only lasted about 130 years, was the Ottoman or the Turkish Empire where, the, where that area was under Muslim control for about 130 years, okay? So now we enter into the British Empire, which lasted, as you can see, really somewhere around 1400 years, just to kind of like a roundabout. And there's a lot of things that start happening in the British Empire, and this is where we're going to be wrapping some things up, okay? Um, and so I'm introducing you now to this man, and many of you may have already heard about these, uh, this family known as the Rothschild family. Uh, their family is still in existence today. This is a book called The House of Rothschild. I didn't really particularly read that book. I was just showing you the, it's like the Roman eagle on there. And this is the first uh, Rothschild that reported that his name was Meyer Amschel Rothschild. You see the dates, he was born 1744, died in 1812. So a lot of stuff is really very interconnected to this man right here. This guy here, I just decided, I, I, studied, I haven't really read any of his stuff in, in a long time, but when I was digging into this, I found this guy. And he had done, a, he wrote this book right here, Bloodlines of the Illuminati. He actually got put in prison. They claimed that he, they caught him with um, like heavy uh, guns, artillery, like artillery, automatic weapons. And he claims in his side of the story, he said, I never ever owned anything like that. Like, I don't even, that's not my thing. And they put him in prison. Uh, and he believes that it was interconnected to his research into all these bloodline families. Um, and so interestingly, some of the names that he exposed was the Rockefellers. Uh, he even claims the Kidnides were part of that. And then he says that there was a family in China known as the Lees. And I think that they're still in existence. But according to most people's the information that you read out there, it's the Rothschild family that seems to be the strongest of, of all of these, um, you know, these bloodline families. Now, what's interesting is, is that some of the things that I read is just as the tribes of Israel kept track of who, what tribe that they, that they came from, these, um, 
these bloodline families supposedly also kept track of where they came from and they supposedly can retrace their lineages back to ancient Egypt and back to ancient Babylon and that they're, they're carrying uh, the torch, if you will, of the light that uh, supposedly Lucifer gave to them, okay? I mean, there's a lot more that we could say, but I'm just trying to give you the, the idea of it, right? Uh, I had, I actually had um, one, I had a Jewish encyclopedia. A lot of people don't return my books whenever I let them borrow. But I found that that Jewish encyclopedia, and in it, it actually said that the Rothschild, I thought it was an interesting thing to find. I mentioned it to somebody pretty smart the other day, and they're like, oh, okay, that doesn't really surprise me to me. But I mean, I guess the thing is, is that what do you believe about these families? And do you believe it's anti-Semitic? to say that the Rothschilds, what does that mean, against the Jewish people or that you're a hater of Jews because you're gonna say that, as a matter of fact, this particular book that I showed y'all, Pawn, Pawns in the Game, there's a newer version out that actually has FBI letters that he sent to the FBI warning them of this worldwide international conspiracy. And it had documentation where the government wrote back to him and said, this information is too, we feel like this is too anti-Semitic. And in the book, he explains that Jesus himself said that there's those that call themselves Jews, but they're of the synagogue of Satan. Is what he says in the book of Revelation. So the Lord warned us that these things would happen. So it's nothing against the Jewish people. It's, it's this point about the money changers and the international banking industry and the central banking industry. And we'll get into that in a little bit of a moment. But yeah, that other version of the book actually had um, that, that information in there. And so ultimately though, what you're saying and what this guy was saying is that you're basically saying that these people are Luciferians. I mean, there's no, there's no more getting, getting away from it. They believe that Lucifer, now listen, you gotta understand, I was reading something last night about this lady that I'll probably end the lecture with named Alice Bailey. And I tried to find the, the little site that I had again. It was came from her trust called Lucis Trust. And I'll, I'll show you some uh, pictures of that. But in it, they were trying to, it sounded like they were trying to take up for her. I read it to Danielle last night. She's like, what? And so in it, they were like, well, they, you know, yes, her publishing company was called Lucifer Publishing, but it was only called that for a little bit. But the word Lucis means the same thing as Lucifer, which basically means holders of the light. And that, you know, Alice, just like Helena Blavatsky, you know, they believed different. You know, they believed that, that Lucifer was an angel and came down to us, hence the fall from the planet Venus, and that he brought to us uh, enlightenment because until he came, man was only an animal. So, that, so that's how they try to twist it to say that knowledge and illumination that came from them. And so to a person that doesn't know any better, maybe it sounded okay. You know, I'll tell you, well, let me, let me not get ahead of myself. Let's just focus on this right now. But so, so these people, what we're saying is that they're Luciferians. Now in their mind, according to the way they try to throw it back at us or back at society is this is not a bad thing. We're here to help people right is what is the way that they would try uh, to word it so this is this is still on the uh, the Rothschild family what I did was I just did a screenshot to show you this is a website that says the Rothschild archive okay and then and in addition to that what I did was I went into the Rothschild archive and I actually found they had a list of their pedig of their pedigrees of the people that were in their family that's what that is and then this is one of the one of the family members, she actually died in 2014. Um, and so this is her too. Now you see, I, I just blew up her little necklace right there. So she just, and she's got one on each time in each one of these pictures, it's a different one. It's a goat head. So basic, and there was an interview where she said, yeah, I don't really wear the goat as much as I used to anymore, but the goat goes back to ancient times. And so I'm just saying, it's pretty obvious that she is 
So again, does this prove that this family's Luciferian? This by itself doesn't prove it, but uh, you know, it sure is a lot of evidence that something's going on, right? And so, yeah, that was her name. I found her name. Her name was Matilde de Rothschild. You know, what's, what's sad is, is, is that I, um, I think it was this picture up here to the left. I don't know, for a second I was sad when I saw she died in 2014. It kind of like made me a little bit sad. You know what I, what I mean? Like, I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. It's like she was deceived. She thought that, I mean, you know what I'm getting? I don't know. I, maybe I shouldn't be sad, but I can't, I mean, I don't want any soul to be in torment like that, you know? And so anyway, so, so this Rothschild, uh, this first one that we talked about, Amschel uh, Bauer Rothschild uh, started off as a uh, working in, in, in the banking industry, started to learn. And that's at least what the Encyclopedia Britannica says. Other people say that he was, he was a jeweler, had big vaults held onto people's gold. It was very difficult for people to transact with gold. So he started writing certificates for gold, but then he started writing more certificates than there was gold. Mm -hmm. And so he created the idea of fractionated banking and really on a credit type system. And, and that's where paper money came from. And in America, back in the day, we used to have a place called Fort Knox. And there was supposed to be exactly the amount of gold to back up the American dollar. And that's been out of existence for a long time. And um, so that's where supposedly some of the ideas for the type of money markets that we have now. Now, look, I'm not getting into this right now because this is about Jerusalem. But there's whole other levels to all this because if you get into Revelation 18, when it talks about Babylon, the great city being destroyed, is talking specifically about financial Babylon. And so what I need you to know is that Revelation 17 says that the harlot is the mother of harlots. That's religious Babylon. The head, seven-headed beast is government Babylon. And Revelation 18 is financial Babylon. And that financial Babylon will one day be destroyed. And where I expect them to go is the next step. I mean, I don't know when. I expect them to try to go to a digital dollar. Uh, there's a whole other level of people out there that are saying, well, I'm just going to say it. They're saying that Trump is, is still in control and that, and that th th I'm just telling you that these, these are other theories out there, that Trump is still in control, that the generals of the United States of America asked him to, to, to lead the country. That that Biden is a is a puppet, and that and that Trump's going to come back and basically he's going to save the day, okay, uh, and and he's going to put the money system back on the gold standard, okay, and and that we're going to have some years of prosperity, okay. Uh, all I can say is I'm I'm not saying that some of those things won't happen, but can I tell you, you need to keep one eye open, even if you vote for the Trumpster. You need to keep one eye open because, look, he already signed an agreement with his Jewish son-in-law with the nation of Israel. I'm not trying to get nobody mad at me. I'm just trying to tell you. Like, I ain't trusting no man. There ain't no man going to save this world other than the man Christ Jesus. And all of this other element of all of this stuff that's going on, you know, is just going to bring in even it's just going to bring another layer. And, and another layer of confusion, another layer. I'm looking to Jesus. And all I'm trying to say is I'll be, even if I vote for a particular person, I, I'm not going to tell you who I'm going to vote for. But even if I vote for a particular person, I can promise you I will be sleeping with one eye open because anytime a man signs an agreement with Israel regarding calling about peace, and it was called the Abrahamic Accord. My eyes are open. You have my attention, sir, because I read Daniel chapter 9. And I understand what's going on. And anybody in the church world that's not aware of that, maybe they need to be reading their Bible more. And maybe they need to be more aware of that. Right? Okay. Right. So anyway, that might get some people mad out there, but I'm not trying to get anybody mad. I'm trying to help people to get, we need to put our thinking caps on. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit because if you think that the enemy wants to deceive people, let me tell you, he wants Jesus' bride because hold on a second. Wow. There, she's a harlot. I'm talking about in the book of Revelation. And what is the church called? The bride. <laughs> and the Lord is wanting 
and the bridegroom is calling his bride. And so what does the harlot want to do? The harlot wants to mess up the marriage. <laughs> the harlot wants to mess up the marriage. And so it seems as though to me that the enemy wants the church more than he wants anybody. And if he can cause confusion and deception to the church, he's happier than causing confusion and deception just to the world itself. That's at least that's the way that I view it. And that's how my brain thinks. All right. So, so Rothschild had five sons or four sons and they ended up spreading out all over Europe. And they, at some point in time, they were able to gain control of the bank of England. Some when during the Napoleon, uh, Nap Napoleonic wars, there was a there was a skirmish that was taking place. It was like a last battle, my understanding. Uh, Wellington, which was a British general, I think I'm saying this right. Wellington against uh, the Napoleon armies, and see the Rothschilds have agents out there. Like you know, y'all heard of George Soros before? He recently said he retired and gave it up. George Soros works for the Rothschilds. Back in the day when Carnegie was in charge of the steel industry, everybody thought he was the richest man in the world. They say when he died, they found out he worked for the wrong child. Like this stuff, like Bill Gates, they say the, the man ain't the richest man in the world. No. These people, they don't you can't even count their money. They might throw some numbers out there to throw you off. You don't know how much these people got. They're trying to just throw you off the scent so you don't know what's going on. And so anyway, they have agents out there. And they cause, they cause, they stir up trouble. Listen, Glenn Beck, not that I was about Glenn Beck. The church was about to hire Glenn Beck. He was a Mormon anyway. I don't mean to be mean. I'm just saying like he's, he, he lives for a different Jesus. It ain't the same Jesus we live for. <laughs> Jesus is not Lucifer's brother. You're not going to get your own planet one day and rule as a God. That's not what the Bible says. Okay, but anyway, Glenn Beck was doing some research when he was working for Fox News. And even that stuff when all them people were staying in tents at Wall Street, whenever all of those crowds, y'all may not remember that, but that was several, several years ago, causing trouble, causing conflict. They found Glenn Beck did the, did the math. Found out George Soros was behind all of that. Putting money in these young people's pockets. Man, we'll pay y'all some money if y'all go out here and, and, and just blew the lid off of it. Next thing you know, Glenn Beck doesn't have a job. Okay, the point being is, is that these kinds of things been going on. These riots and all this kind of stuff that happens, I'm telling you right now, there's no reason that some of these things should happen the way that they do. I'm not trying to say there's not injustices, but it's, it's craziness the way that all of a sudden everything could be okay. And then the next thing you know, there's just riots all over the place. And what I'm trying to say is this. Is, is that there's there's things that are going on on the earth and we don't have all the answers and they're trying to cause trouble and they're trying to cause confusion in the midst of all of that, all right? And so uh, so we're going back to, this is, this is Rothschild and uh, this is, this guy's name, you may not be able to see the name, but his name was Adam Weishoff, okay? So Adam Weishoff was trained in a Jesuit university in Ingolstadt, I think it was in Bavaria, all right? And supposedly he defected from the Catholic faith and he was contacted by the Rothschild guy and Rothschild, this is what the Rothschild guy said. He said, you're, um, and this is my paraphrase, you're hired, initiate the ancient doctrines of Lucifer. So he accomplished his task, supposedly is the way it's documented, May 1st, 1776. Interesting because that's the same year that the Declaration of Independence was signed, if my, if my historical stuff is, is correct. And May 1st is actually a high occult day. That's, that's what they call May Day, ring around the posy, pocket full. I think that's all connected, the Maypole and all of that kind of stuff like that. And so... They joined forces to bring the age old plan of the enemy going back to ancient, like they have their own books. I mean, they have, there's books called the book of the dead that could supposedly comes from Egypt. I got into all of that stuff. Not now. I never read nothing about their spells and stuff like that. It was just to learn the history. Cause I got a hold of a couple of things along the way that I was like, dude, you just got into a spot. You wasn't supposed to be in here. And I, I'm warning you right now. I've, I knew a young man that was a youth leader in this town. 
and 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 he and I were talking about this, and he had already tapped into this stuff, you know, before I started talking to him. And he he came to the conclusion Jesus was not Messiah, and he quit serving the Lord. He he's like done. And so I'm just telling you right now, there's a lot of deception out there, and you don't want to just be playing around with with this this stuff. You got to be you do have to be careful. And so this is I wanted you to see this. So we're so we're talking about. Um, part of what Weishoff was doing was, uh, so I'm going to read you an excerpt out of this particular book right here, this pawns in the game book. I went ahead and copied it into my notes and I just was going to read you this excerpt. If you got a little bit of a second, the Luciferian conspiracy in 1784 says an act of God, it was actually a strike of lightning, hit a horseback rider in Bavaria and knocked him dead to the ground, according to the story, and that letters were found on his person, okay? An act of God placed the Bavarian government in possession of evidence which proved the existence of the continuing Luciferian conspiracy. Adam Weishoff, a Jesuit-trained professor of canon law, defected from Christianity and embraced the Luciferian ideology, while teaching in Ingolstadt University in 1770, the money lenders the, who had recently organized the House of Rothschild retained him to revise and modernize the age-old protocols designed to give the synagogue of Satan ultimate world domination so they can impose the Luciferian ideology upon what remains of the human race. Weishoff completed his task May 1st, 1776. The plan required the destruction of all existing governments and religions. This objective was to be reached by dividing the masses whom he termed goyim, which means human cattle. <laughs> That's what these people see human beings as cattle that need to be herded. Uh, into opposing camps in ever increasing numbers on political, racial, social, economic, and other issues. The opposing sides were then to be armed and an incident provided which would cause them to fight and weaken themselves as they destroyed national governments and religious institutions. So you see what they do. They, they stir up things in society to get people to fight amongst themselves and to cause division and chaos, right, so that they bring themselves down in the midst of the confusion. In 1776, Weishoff organized the Illuminati to put the plot into execution. The word Illuminati is derived from Lucifer and means holders of the light. Using the lie that his objective was to bring about a one world government to enable men with proven mental ability to govern the world, he recruited about 2,000 followers. These included the most intelligent men in the field of arts and letters, education, the sciences, finance, industry. So this particular slide, you may not be able to see it real good. I don't know if you can see it better now, but this is a Yale, this is Yale University secret society. It's called the skull and the bones. Okay. It's well known. I mean, it's easy. You can easily look this stuff up and you see how they got this human skull right here. And then they got the skull and bones right here. Well, this guy right here is actually George H. Bush, uh, which is George W. Bush's son. And George Bush was also a skull and bone, and so was John Kerry. I have a couple of, so all I'm trying to say is this. These included the most intelligent men in the field of arts, letters, education, science, finance. And then he goes on to, to say, uh, okay, here we go. So I'm going to keep reading. He then established lodges of the Grand Orient to be, this is Masonic lodges, to be their secret headquarters. Weishoff's revised plan required his Illuminati to do the following things to help them accomplish their purpose. Use monetary and sex bribery to obtain control of people already occupying positions in high places in the various levels of all governments and other fields of human endeavor. Once an influential person had fallen for the lies, deceits, and temptations of the Illuminati, they were to be held in bondage by application of political and other forms, blackmail, and threats of financial ruin, public exposure, and physical harm, and even death to themselves and loved ones. 
Illuminati on the faculties of colleges, and you, this is the part I want you to see, right? Illuminati on the faculties of colleges and universities were to recommend students possessing exceptional mental ability. Now, some people might question George W. on that but because of the way they clowned him back in the day, but possessing exceptional mental ability belonging to well-bred families with international leanings in well-bred families. So, uh, so basically what they're saying is, is that these Illuminati people, and there's an interconnection between the Jesuits also connected to this because many of these colleges are Jesuit and they, they're in there and they're looking for the brightest for the, for these young people that are interconnected to these families that have money that are well-bred and they're, and they're like actually reaching out to them and they're, and they're trying to get them to come over to their side and to mold them. You know, I don't, I don't think that, okay, I'm not going to say his name, but it's somebody that's very, that's been in this church for quite some time with us. He actually is the one that helped me start the church. He literally told me that after he did his prison sentence, he received a letter in the mail. It was a very cryptic letter. And it basically said, if you come to work for us, you will never have to worry about another thing. We're giving you an opportunity. We, we, are, we will only reach out one more time. We recommend that you give this serious thought, you know, and whatever it was, whatever it said. And he just, he said, I, you know, I don't know what this was. Crumble it up, throw it away. And they sent him one more letter and, and it said something similar to that. And he said the only thing that he could figure, he felt like it was interconnected to something really, really big. I mean, he didn't know if it could have been mafia or something like that. And he said the only thing that he could figure was that when he actually went to prison, that he took the rap for all of the people that were there. He did his time and he never, and he said, and actually somebody had, told an attorney in New Orleans that was very highly connected that came and reached out to him and told him, he said, he said, I'm here to represent you. And this person said, how much is it going to cost more than you can afford? You don't need to worry about that. I'm here to represent you. And, and it's, he almost felt like when it was all said and done, it was a trial period to see how he was going to handle it. And and I mean, that's a crazy story. So that's just one person that I know that's, that's interconnected. You can't prove exactly who it was that was reaching out to him, but you see a similar concept that they're in these colleges and they're, and they're looking for people and they're vetting them and they're trying to see, because when it's all said and done, they have a plan, right? And so I thought this was interesting. So you got George Bush and John Kerry, look, they're sitting next to each other right here, okay? And this doesn't necessarily prove anything, I get that, but in my mind, it's like, okay. So they were both in the skull and bones. Uh, they both graduated around the same time. It's kind of hard to see the numbers. It looks like maybe Bush 68, maybe Kerry 66, but look, Bush defeats Kerry. Isn't that something? It's kind of like they go to the same school, they're in the same club, and then one of them ends up a Democrat, the other one ends up a Republican, they run against each other. It's all, and they're both in the same secret society. You know, and, and it's like, it's almost like no matter who wins, yeah, you, you, you know, you got the person in there that you want in there anyway. Uh, so, so and now I'm going to introduce you to another guy. We're getting close to the end guys. So this guy's name is general Albert Pike. Uh, he's also mentioned in this book. He, Albert Pike was a Confederate general. He was also the le a leader in the Illuminati, a well-known leader in the Illuminati. He was a leader. He was, the, he was in charge of all Freemasonry in the United States. And uh, he wrote a book called Morals and Dogma. He was a Luciferian. In his book, Morals and Dogma, he basically says Lucifer is God. He's the one that brought us light. Okay, so in this letter, again, in this book that I told you about, Pawns in the Game, Again, they also, they uncovered another letter, okay, is what the story goes. And so in 1871, Confederate General Albert Pike, who was a Luciferian and high-ranking the leader of the Masons, he wrote a letter to the leader of the Illuminati during the time in Italy, which was a man named Mazzini. The letter was also intercepted. It described three world wars. So this is really where we're getting to the point right here of what could be going on in Jerusalem. And so this is where I really, I know I've kind of like strung you along here, but this is the, this is the coup de grace, if you will. This is the, the, the final 
peace, okay? And it says right here, he wrote a letter to the late leader of the Illuminati, okay? The letter was intercepted, it described three world wars that would move the world closer to a new world order. Pike's plan was as simple as it pro has proved effective. Now, this book was written in the 50s, okay? He required that communism, Nazism, and political Zionism and other international movements be organized and used to cause three global wars and three major revolutions. The first world war was to be fought so as to enable the Illuminati to overthrow the powers of the czars in Russia. Listen, there's a whole piece of history connecting back to the Tsar Nicholas and the Romanov dynasty in Russia before Russia was ever communist. That is some interesting information. There was a weird mystic involved in all that, some guy named Rasputin. Many people have heard of him. It, it, it's just, a, to me, it was fascinating. But this is the point. A lot of people don't know that Russia used to not be communist and that Tsar Nicholas was actually Eastern Orthodox Christian. And that many people say that he was actually a good man and that he was running the country in that way. But political Zionism. Now, listen, when I say political Zionism, I want you to understand we're talking about the Rothschild family been in existence since the 1700s. When we're talking about Zionism, we're talking about the nation of Israel, polit not the nation, but the people. The leaders of Israel, these Luciferian people using the concept of Zionism to bring about change in the world that they desire to bring about, if that makes sense. All right. And so uh, the First World War would enable the Illuminati to overthrow the powers of the czars in Russia and turn that country into the strong into a stronghold of atheistic communism. Wow. So just trying to get your attention here for a second. Russia used to not be communist. Sometime after World War I, it became communist. The story goes that actually the Rothschild agents went to Tsar Nicholas's house and took the family down to the basement and killed them. It's part of what basically happened. So they don't get their way, they just take people out. Okay. Uh, so... Um, the first, so that's what the first world war to do, turn that country into a stronghold of communism. The differences stirred up by the agents of the Illuminati between the British and German empires were to be used to cause this war to begin. After the war ended, communism was to be built up and used to destroy other governments and weaken religions. World War II was to be caused by using the differences between fascists and the political Zionists. This war was to be fought so that Nazism would be destroyed and the power of political Zionism increased so that the sovereign state of Israel could be established. Now, I want, I want you to think about that. The plan of world, according to this letter, according to this general, the plan of World War II was that after it was done, Nazism would be destroyed. Okay, we're not going to get into all that stuff about Nazism, but and that the state of Israel would be reestablished. All right. I listened, even while I was on vacation, I listened to secular interviews on political Zionism, people that do not believe any of this stuff that I'm saying. And they, they, he, but they said, oh, no, the nation of Israel didn't have anything to do with religion. The nation of Israel had to do with creating a state because the world felt the world felt sorry for Israel because the people were dispersed all over the world. They might have had some Jews living in the area that they call Palestine, but they had no nation. They had no, they had no, no power, right? They had nowhere to go. And so the world in their sympathy, supposedly, can you do wink, wink? The world in their sympathy helped to, to create the nation of Israel that we know today. I'm about to talk to you about that a little bit more, but do you understand where we're going? That's what it said in this secular interview that had nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with the occult. Okay, just an expert on, on, this, on the history of this declaration that I'm about to talk to you about. 
Okay. And so the, in the end of Second World War, that's what happened. That's when the nation of Israel came back into existence. So most people don't even understand what we're, where we're about to go with this. So that, that, that's a big piece of the puzzle, right? All right. And so, so during World War II, international communism was to be built up until it equaled in strength that of united Christendom. At this point, it was to be contained and kept in check until required for the final social cataclysm. Can any informed person deny Roosevelt and Churchill did put this policy into effect? So that's what he was saying. And, and this guy claims in his lecture about the book that Winston Churchill was for, forced into the Illuminati at some point in time in the process, right? All right. World War Three. Here you go. Y'all ready for this? World War Three is caused by using the differences that the agents of the Illuminati stir up between political Zionists, that's talking about the political nation of Israel and the leaders of the Muslim world. Okay, I know I've kept y'all here a long time. Let me just go ahead and say that again. So World War III, through the agents of the Illuminati, are supposed to stir up confusion between the state, the, the political Zionists in the state of Israel and Muslim leaders around the world. The war is to be directed in such a manner that Islam, the Arab world, including Mohammedism and political Zionism, including the state of Israel, will destroy themselves while at the same time remaining nations, one more divided against each other on this issue, will be forced to fight themselves in a state of complete exhaustion, physically, mentally, spiritually, economically, and can any unbiased and reasoning person deny that the intrigue now going on in the near Middle East and Far East designed to accomplish this devilish purpose? So obviously, even back in the 50s, you could see things like this were happening when he wrote this book. Okay, but as we know, things have already been rapidly changing in the world from 9-11 to COVID to all of these things. And now we see something like this happening. Is this it? That's not what I'm saying. But whenever it takes place, I expect it to look something like this, or at least that's what their plan is. Okay. Um, so that was the, the three world wars. To topple the czars of Russia, change it to communism, exterminate Nazism, make, make a Zionist state of Israel, and agitate war between the Arab nations and Israel. Now, this is one of the things that I wanted to show you. I, I, have, I just read a long article the other night on this flag. Uh, this is a book right here that I, that, are, that I bought way back when I was researching all this stuff, Masonic and Occult Symbols Illustrated. And I have right here, this is, this is their, their, the star. You know, this goes back to ancient Hinduism long before. So the flag of, and I, and I actually have a link. I might try to see if Danielle can put the link to the article if you care. It was a pretty long article. But it was all about the flag, that it was actually instituted in 1897. Okay, you get that? So the Israel flag of, of the, the, the quote unquote Zionist flag was instituted in 1897. And, and what I want you to see is, is that it's made up of two triangles. Okay, and it's got all kind of occult connection to it. So it's made up of a, of a, a rising up triangle and then the other triangle laid on top of it. And you can see how it's interconnected to the flag. And again, the flag didn't come into existence until 1897. Now I believe that that's interesting because I'm about to share this with you. So I want you to see this. The Balfour Declaration of 1917. Has anybody ever heard of that? You can just raise your hand if you've heard of that. Okay, so the Balfour Declaration of 1917. So to the left is a guy named Lord Balfour, which was a leader in the British Empire. And the guy to the right was, the, was a guy, his name is Lord Rothschild. You can't see it, but I can read it right here. <laughs> so here's, the, here's a letter. It says, written to, it says, Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. 
it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of the existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring to this, this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation, signed Lord Balfour. So what I'm trying to say is, is that in 1917, Lord Balfour, a leader in the British government, went to bat under the influence with this Rothschild person and got the British government to agree to allow the nation of Israel to become a nation again, okay? Now, let me just make this clear. I made it clear in the first video, but I think it's important that I say this. God is sovereign and he is in control. I said in Revelation 17, 17, when it's talking about the beast and all of their plans and how these kingdoms are gonna give their power over to the beast, that the Lord put it in their heart to do this thing. So ultimately, whatever is going to take place upon the earth, just like God hardened Pharaoh's heart, then Pharaoh turned around and hardened his own heart. They think they got their own plan going on and they don't even realize it. But God is putting it in their heart to do whatever it is that they think they're doing because God is orchestrating the end to come because there's coming a day when John won't have to worry about weeping no more because when he got his vision in heaven, the Bible says that he was weeping and the elder asked him, why do you weep? There ain't nobody to open the scroll. No, there's somebody that's worthy to open the scroll. And he said, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he turned to look for a lion. And he found a lamb as though he had been slain. Jesus is worthy to open the seals. And one day he's going to open seal number one. And it's going to release the, the Antichrist to be able to wreak havoc upon the earth. It's, the Bible says in seal number one that the rider of the white horse is going to be given a crown. Now, I mean, you think that's Jesus? That's not Jesus. Jesus didn't come back on this white horse till Revelation 19. Who gave him the crown? Somebody's telling me the church gave him the crown. Church ain't got that kind of power. Yeah, the church has not operated the way that she was supposed to. The Bible says he's given, God has deemed it to be so. It's coming down. It's going to go down. When it goes down, I don't know. But the point is, is this, is that this is, this is some crazy information right here. But at the same time, God is ultimately in control. He's sovereign and he's orchestrating the whole thing. He's allowing it to happen. Amen. Uh, I want you to know this though. In 1948, the British Empire backed away and then the United Nation actually made Israel a nation. So that's, that's crazy. We're getting real close to the end here. But I want you to introduce you to this woman here, Alice Bailey. And the reason, listen, I read her book on don't ask me why I did, but I did. It's called Solar Man to do with the Sun Initiation. I I was I didn't read I don't know that I read the whole thing, but I was blown away. She was using words like atonement. Uh, she used the uh, the Christ. I mean, when you first started reading, it almost sounded like like it was Christian. But then when I got to the part where she says, "No, the Buddha was an avatar," an avatar. Jesus was an avatar, but the final one is yet to come. See, they're still waiting. New Age is waiting for one. Islam's waiting for one. Israel's waiting for one. And the one that comes first is not the one we're waiting for. Anyway, the name of her company was called Lucifer Publishing. And uh, the name of this particular book, it, it says initiation. This is the name of the book. Initiation, human and soul are the consciousness of the atom letters on occult meditation. <clears throat> this is this is a book that was stamped by Congress. Now, I'm just trying to make a point to you. I'm trying to read it. It says uh, initiation, human and soul are by Alice Bailey, author of letters on occult meditation. The. Consciousness of the Atom, first edition, Lucifer Publishing Company, Broadway, New York City. Um, so I wanted you to see that. Now, <laughs> I, I kind of pulled a quick one on you. I don't know if you saw that or not, but let me, let me go back to this. So you see right here, it says Lucifer Publishing Company. Well, when I clicked on this, then I clicked on that. Well, look, all of a sudden, look at Lucifer Publishing Company. She changed the name to Lucis Trust at some point in time. 
but that the words basically mean the same, okay? So I looked up Luce's trust and connected it to the United Nations because I've been knowing that she was connected to the United Nations way back whenever I read this. And okay, now you gotta understand, she wrote this book in, 19, uh, in 1922. The Balfour Declaration was 1917. Israel became a nation again in 1948. And what I want you to know is her interconnection at a kind of a high level with the United Nations. You understand what I'm saying? This may not prove it to some, anything to some people, but it's just some weird connections going on here. Okay, so I'm going to read it to you. So about us, so you see she's got her pyramid because this is actually from Lucis Trust. It says the Lucis Trust has cons consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations and World Goodwill is recognized by the Department of Global Communications at the United Nations as a non-governmental organization. As such, the trust and world goodwill are part of a community of many hundreds of NGOs that play an active role in the United Nations. Look at this particularly in spreading information about the UN and fostering support for UN programs. Since their inception, Lucis Trust and World Goodwill, does that even make you think of anything? When you, when you hear the words World Goodwill, what, is, what does that make you think of? I mean, it makes me think of a new world order, but it makes me think of the Tower of Babel and it makes me think of the spirit of Babel. Like we're going to help humanity and it sounds so good. We're going to help humanity. We're just going to do it without God or we're going to do it with our own God. And it's not the one that you believe in because he's bringing light and y'all need to get on board with this. You bunch of agitators are going to call us agitators one day. But anyway, let me just keep reading. Since its inception, Lucis Trust and World Goodwill have given their support. Look at this. How'd you do that? Through meditation, educational materials, and seminars by highlighting the importance of the UN's goals and activities as they represent the voice of the people and nations of the world. So back in 1922, the name of her company started off as Lucifer Publishing. She was already interconnected. She was doing publishing work for the United Nations back then. This is current. Lucis Trust still is in existence. And I looked up other sites and I didn't feel like getting into it all. But her, the name Lucis Trust is within the United Nations documentation. So that's interesting to me because she's a straight up Luciferian. She's a straight up black magic practitioner. She's a, she, she's, and she's interconnected with the United Nations. I mean, it's nothing that we didn't already know, but it's to or to feel or to think, but it's like to see it in writing is, is really kind of wild.